Hello viewers, welcome. Come listen to this video to hear the tale of the mighty giant who now blesses the land with barrels of gold. The giant who now graces the very universe with its cure to greed and avarice. Today we talk about the rise and the fall of Mapargus. Far off in the demon realm, there is a mighty giant known as Mapargus. This demon was of gargantuan size, able to lay down and cover an entire mountain range as he used such landscapes simply as bedding. Unlike most demons, the giants are of all mere appearance, and procreate through feasting. By maintaining a gullet of appropriate size, their belly will swath and swirl like a pack of eels was living underneath the skin. Truth is, those are the children, who when developed will peel out of their father's belly and fall to the floor, rising up as new giants. Giants get their size from feasting. If a giant is starved, they won't die of starvation, but rather just simply stop growing and reproducing. Hence why in today's day and age we don't have giants, only half giants. Giants who are stunted in growth and thanks to their slavery status in society do not reproduce. But how could a mighty figure who towers the sky, a figure who's using mountaintops as thrones, fall? Well, long, long ago, thousands of years before the first of the banished race entered the hell zone that is the demon realm, Mapargus had a mate. In giant terms, a person they cared for deeply and worked together as companions, sometimes even hunting buddies. Unfortunately for Mapargus was, at this time, not his gargantuan size that he is well known for, and he and his mate were ambushed. The very fiend that would feast on the two this day was none other than the fiery spider demon known as Arachnagorst, bringer of Arachnarak. This spider craved flesh, and these two were large enough to sake its hunger. The battle, while fierce, was not winnable. The Pargos had to flee, leaving behind his mate at his mate's behest. When Mepargus returned, he saw what horrified him the most. His mate's body was turned into a nest to spawn more spider demons. Having no chance to kill the large spider fiend, Mepargus made it his mission, his goal. I will stomp that spider and squish him beneath my foot. He stormed off to the other side of the world, a place safe from Arachnagorst, but also abundant in food for him to complete his mission. The Screaming Mountain Range. This mountain range is unique in that the winds make a screaming howl noise thanks to the orchestrated cliff locations. Mepargus, still uncontrollably spawning children from his gullet, laid onto these mountain range, consuming the salt deposits that was there to help facilitate the growth of his size. And as he grew, he ordered his guideless children this creed. I am your father. God is my name, as is Mapargos. Fetch me sustenance, and for the feast I am provided, I shall bid unto you a feast of a millennia. He swiped a mountaintop away, forming a flat plateau for which his half-giants could bring sacrifices that he could consume. Here, Mapargus stayed asleep to conserve energy and help increase his size. His belly was still spewing out half-giants who would be quickly inducted into the giant cult. They each forbade consumption of food until their father was sated. Here his downfall had come. As he became complacent and accustomed to swiping victims from his sacrifice altar, he no longer inspected nor cared to lift his head to see what was being sacrificed. Soon a load of settlers would arrive. They were not demon, but they were a banished people coming from a realm where they lost a war 
and as terms for their defeat were banished to hell, the demon realm. As the settlers arrived at the mountain range, they were quickly subjugated by the half-giants and were deemed great sacrifices, as to the demons, the feelings of its victims added sweetness to the flavor. The Pargus, though not awake, as he consumed most of the settlers, seeing the settlers dwindle rapidly and no sign of their father slash god from awakening, a smart giant cultist named Eblin Rottenmouth. He rose and decreed that they must keep the settlers in a small population to help them procreate so they can have a stable supply of food for their god. Many took this as pure inspiration and set about decreeing a limit to exactly how many of these people they could take versus how many of them they should leave behind. So this went on for 200 years. Instead of hunting for roaming demon packs to feed their father, instead they focused on herd gathering where they kept these people subjugated. That is, until an unsuspecting band of warriors arrived. Far off, in the city of Haguvast, a poor woman of the banished race was born. Her name was Iga Presk. She was not poor in a financial sense. She was poor in that she was gifted with the ever-seeing third eye that many prophets are gifted with. But her third eye only played back one vision. Over and over, she would be racked with nightmares of this vision years turning into decades of torture. She watched in horror as her city, her loved ones, her very species would be burned and stomped out to death by the giant Mapargus. Having had enough of the torture, she sought out some reclaimers, specifically the guild named Willow's Fate, and she desired to find the legendary book called Belleth's Grimoire. Belleth's Grimoire is a massive book about summoning demons. It boosted the caster's abilities to make their demon summons larger and stronger by nearly two times the amount of normal mages. With the book in hand, she quickly dispatched the Willow's Fate scribe that was with her, being very well aware that the guild usually kills the client to claim the artifacts. And so she set off bringing up her wealth to fund her own personal army consisting of slaves, demons, soldiers, mercenaries, even volunteers who were saved by Iga Presk. This war band she assembled was called Envisioned Doom, for it was their duty to stop the foreseen doom of Mapargus. They practiced the arts of slaying demons that stood two heads taller than a man. They became the perfect half-giant killers as they finally reached around the world to their destination. The Screaming Range Mountains. Here Iga would liberate the settlers from their 200-year torment, but instead of receiving thanks, she was instead met with suspicion. Indeed, it would be unwise to willingly trust such a person who holds an entire army consisting of some demons and a large purse of mercs. As she fought onwards, defeating the giant cult over and over again, she found a unique individual who would change the course of her life forever. Illifer, a half-giant, but he openly despised his siblings. He emerged from saving Iga from an ambush by howling out their positions and then backstabbing his own men. Here, Illifer and Iga met in secret. They talked about their goals and how it would be best to deal with Mapargus. After a night of talking by the fire, the two struck a deal. What that deal was, none could say, but the two became close. It was something that revolted her followers as this hellish landscape, being a friend, was considered taboo, but even worse was being a friend with a demon. As they went through passageways and avoided fights with giant cultists, Iga's own men started to desert her, claiming that Illifer was tainting their cause and openly stating how they wished to spill giant blood, not scurry about like rats in secret tunnels. 
Iga did not care for their protest. She paid them no mind, as the envisioned doom shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until that very fateful day. Long five weeks of traveling the Screaming Range Mountains. Her band of warriors was just a simple quarter of its original size, and here they finally reached the spot. A large altar, flat and open to the sleeping giant's head, right in front of it. Illifer told her, Here, my father swipes up instinctively anything that touches the altar. He does not even feel the sacrifice as it stabs his city-sized hands. You best know what you are doing. Iga gave him a small gesture of comfort as she separated from the band and Illifer. Slowly she strode towards the altar, embracing her destiny. Reading the Bellus Grimoire, she opens the book and feels magic course through her third eye. Opening all three of her eyes, they turn into pure red with lightning cackling out of her, scorching the very ground as she poured all of her energy. Tears seen streaking her cheeks in pure rage as she relived the nightmare one last time and pours her anger into this mighty spell. Before the altar, it was summoned. A greater fire demon, the size of a spire, it bellowed like a furnace, roaring to kill its summoner. That is when Mepargus instinctively grabbed the demon and swallowed it whole. Upon consumption, the greater fire demon clung to Mepargus' throat and emblazoned itself, scorching oxygen before it could reach Mepargus' lungs. Mepargus awakened in a panic. He swiped the mountaintops, rushing out from his slumbering spot. He clenched his neck, trying to breathe as smoke kept billowing out of his mouth and his nostrils. He stopped and stomped until finally, before he squashed the city of Cordcree, he fell. As he died, his body got consumed with flames. But these were flames of a golden hue. These flames, when cooled down, turned into solid gold. All rushed out of the Screaming Mountain range and praised Iga for her deeds and Illifer for standing up to his father. But unfortunately, Iga was dead, smushed to paste with her chest piece remaining. Many claim Illifer killed her as there is a small back piece that looks punctured and have dedicated themselves to overthrowing Illifer as he became the new overlord of the brand new city called Divin. The guild became known as Prest, the Envision Doom, you may ask, what happened to them? My, they became Illifer's bodyguards, his own personal army that has, at many times, held off multiple forces to keep the city secured. Now, what happened to the giant cult and the half giants, you may ask? Well, they were all subjugated and enslaved. None would feed their half giant slave in fearing of another Mapargus rising. As it stands, half-giants are a dying breed, due to none of them being adequate size to reproduce. A breed that many feel should die after the crimes they committed. So that has been the tale of Mepargus. This has been a works that I created. I created this whole story from scratch. I hope you enjoyed, and as always, let me know down below what you think. Do you enjoy this when I release my creativity and just write down these amazing stories? Did you feel that it dragged on in certain areas? Let me know down below. Besides that, see you guys next time.